Hi, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce um, our third panelist. Um, so this morning we'll be speaking transmission, acts of transmission. I want to say um, to begin that two participants who were meant to be with us this morning um, had to cancel last minute um, this week. And both of them are very sorry um, for not being able to be with all of us. Uh, Angel Salio, um, who is based in the US but had to travel um, to France uh, after a sudden death in her family, and Serge Laurent, um, uh, uh, the curator of Dance Reflections, um, the festival that's going on um, in New York at the moment, um, had an accident two days ago, and it is very sorry um, not to be here, part of the conversation, but is sending his um, warmest thoughts. Um, I want to say this because um, Serge was very instrumental in us thinking this panel together. The question of transmission is for him um, foundational um, in how he envisions and how he practices curation. Um, he, um, I don't want to paraphrase him, but um, he's been talking a lot about the ways in which he curates contemporary dance um, or experimental dance. Um, but that for him, it is important that his curation can make manifest the ways in which these choreographers, these works draw on different histories, right? Um, to make manifest the, the lineages um, across those works. So, um, yes. Um, I want to thank André Lefecki, who accepted to uh, step in. Uh, we are thrilled that you are with us uh, this morning. Yes. So. André is um, a writer, a curator, and also professor in the Department of Performance Studies at NYU, where he's also currently the Associate Dean of Research and Study. Thank you. Thank you, Noemi, and good morning, everybody. Thank you, esteemed panelists. Um, very quickly, I'm, I am just the moderator, but so I'll try not to, not to say too much. But, you know, maybe just a little, little note um, to think about act of transmission as the theme and just linking back to what we just heard before the beautiful conversation between Dorothy and Will. Um, and maybe there's a way in which you can continue the line of transmissions. Um, I find it very, very intriguing that in this very distinguished panel that we have here with Anne Colo and Linda Murray and David Thompson, we have ways of thinking about curation, collection, um, documenting, archiving, reenacting, reviving, but in a way like the word transmission, or actually when the word transmission is linked to the act of transmission, I feel that something happens as well, which is a kind of affective charge on all the missions that we have, like it's almost like dry terms, like collecting, <laughs> like, but they charge or, or preserving or reviving, right? So they charge with something that I feel both of you talked about because your conversation was beautiful because it was linked directly to questions of life and death, right? Which are the questions of that really matter, right? In a sense. And I have the impression that if there's an art that deals directly with questions of life and death is dance, right? Um, so I think like within this, we can maybe prolong and have a conversation. There is a choreography. I'm here like also enacting a line of transmission from Noemi Solomon, which said, you know, each one of the panelists will have five minutes for uh, five, six minutes, take a little bit of time to talk about um, their, whatever they have to say in relationship to this these topics um, and then after that I'll have a few questions and then Ruth Stevis which um, I can't oh hi okay <laughs> he's in the room we'll have also uh, a response uh, to the panel and then we finish uh, the event yeah all right so we agreed that we're just gonna go down the line and it's my pleasure to give the word to Linda Murray thank you 
Um, so I, my name is Linda, and I am the curator of the Jerome Robbins Dance Division at the New York Public Library. So when I think about transmission, I'm ordinarily thinking about, you know, to go to the life and death. I'm dealing with archives of people who have left us, bodies which held repositories of dance, which are no longer here. And how do we carry that history forward? And how do we connect it into dance making that's happening now? Um, archives, as you probably all know, are traditionally um, places where we store dance film, but also things like choreographic notation, um, correspondence between artists, photographs, costumes, ephemera. If there's anything that's even vaguely related to the field of dance, there's probably some representation for it in the archive. Um, since 1967, my division has also been filming dance, so we'll be filming Dorothy this week at New York Live Arts. Um, so that, that means that we send video crews out all over the city and in fact across the country uh, to make recordings um, so that we can add to the archive as well as the films we receive directly from artists. And then in 1974, my division began an oral history project, which is ongoing. Um, and that was a really important act of transmission that I think was acknowledged in, in that moment. As much as the moving image was uh, necessary and helped, all of us who have danced know that so much information in the studio is transmitted orally. I mean, yes, we are we are looking at each other's bodies, but there's a there's an entire history of intent and meaning in work, um, and and sort of the social underpinning of the why of the work that is communicated to us through stories. And dancers have long been denied their voice, um, so the oral history was uh, an important way to give dance artists agency over telling their the stories of their careers and their lives and how that intersected with their work. And that also continues to this day. Um, to, I, I, I absolutely agree with you, Andre. I think that, you know, when we talk about the act of transmission, like there's the collecting, there's the, there's the gathering things in, but I think the work of curation when you manage an archive is trying to think through ways in which to make the transmission happen. Um, and you can't be passive in that act. Uh, so a lot of my work is spent around thinking about ways to activate the archive and to, um, to bring artists in and to get them to see the archive as a catalyst and a tool for work uh, that they might want to make. Um, one of the projects that we, uh, we undertake, um, and Nancy Dalva is in the room and is a great supporter of this project, so thank you, Nancy. Um, we have the Dance Research Fellowship, which is yes for academics, but also for practitioners as well. Um, so it, it's a way to bring choreographers and dance artists in and just get them to think differently about their dance making and to give them space and time to just be in an archive and to see where that leads them. Um, if you happen to go see Pam Tanowitz's piece, Song of Songs, at City Center in a couple of weeks, uh, one of the origin points for that piece for her began with the fellowship. She, it was during the pandemic, and um, she wanted to um, study Jewish dance. Uh, Pam is Jewish. It was something she'd never really reflected on until her father died. Uh, and so she spent six months looking at like old Jewish dance manuals teaching herself like the steps from these funny little drawings with like little feet print, like footprints on maps, um, filming herself doing that, breaking it all down, building it up into something else, and then finally setting it on an entire ensemble of dancers. So it was beautiful to help her go on that journey in a small way. Um, another thing that we've really sort of been reflecting on is giving the artist power in how the archive gets shaped and also thinking through the absences and the gaps in the archive. Uh, for us in our particular archive, that gap was in the area of social dance. Um, so we did a, a, a very good job in our 80 year history of gathering um, information about concert dance. Um, but when it came to um, American social dance styles, which have been incredibly influential on in what we end up seeing on the stage, we did not have much representation for that. There are understandable reasons behind that. If dance at 
is commodified and is commercialized. And when you monetize something, you create ephemera around it. Um, so like when you go to perform on a stage, you have to sell tickets, which means that you're getting a professional photographer in, you're creating marketing materials. Somebody may come in and film the dance. If you think about how social dance happens in a community setting, you don't have the same sort of need to advertise what you're doing, but it also means that it leaves behind um, very little of a trace. So we've been inviting in guest artists from communities where we have identified gaps, um, and we've been asking them to gather elders from their field and also to bring in young dancers from the same community. Uh, we have a dance studio that goes into one of our exhibition spaces for a couple of months a year in our building, um, and we invite them in for two-week residencies, and we set a, again, we set up a camera crew, um, and we ask the elders to set dances that are lost from within their community on the young dancers. We film the whole process and then we do oral histories with the elders. That's been really beautiful in building uh, an intergenerational sense of community, uh, but it's also been a wonderful way for us to expand the archive uh, in a way where the artist feels like they have control over the, the, the boundaries of the project. Um, and the terms in which we engage with them. So this summer we did a two-week residency with uh, Maria Torres on The Hustle, and we went in, yeah, it was good. <laughs> she made a soul dance. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was, for me, it was a huge education um, because they were really breaking down a social history of New York in the 1970s. Um, the choreographies that they were demonstrating for us were distinguishing between communities in Brooklyn and the Bronx. Um, and they also got into like how the hustle traveled to places like Philadelphia and Philly. And Paris was also a huge place for the hustle. Um, so Paris also got a mention in there. Um, and um, we're, so we, that was a two week residency uh, where we sort of traced that. And we're now kind of catching up and doing the oral histories with the, they didn't like to be called elders. They liked to be called innovators. Um, <laughs> um, and then in uh, December, um, and there's always public hours. So if anybody wants to come in December, the first two weeks of December, we'll be working with Suku McMiller um, on Mambo. Um, so 1950s and 1960s, uh, Mambo specifically in New York City, and again, uh, the transmission of that information and the inevitable sort of shifts over time as communities assimilate and like other, other influences, global influences come into the form. So kind of tracing that lineage from something that's more local into something that then has sort of a wider reach. So I think that's just a little bit of what we do, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, hello, so I'm Anne Collot, choreographer based in Paris, and um, transmission is at the heart of my practice as a choreographer, but also as a pedagogue. And the question that matters to me uh, is how to make transmission an act of uh, emancipation. So a significant part of my work is devoted to the recreation, to the reinterpretation of uh, dance works from the 20th century, and most of them are uh, from uh, North American uh, modern or postmodern dance, as uh, I, it seems I have a never-ending interest and curiosity for it. Um, how to do dance work survive, travel through space and time, and how can they be recreated? That's a big question, and of course the archives are a big part of it. And uh, as you all know in dance, there is this uh, tradition of oral transmission, from choreographer to performer, from uh, teacher to student, with all its uh, rich richness and uh, limits also. And probably what is special about my link with transmission is uh, that it's based on text, scores, archives, and uh, whether in lab and kinetography, an abstract system, some of you might know, uh, for writing and analyzing movement that I studied at the uh, Conservatoire de Paris, 
And it was around that tool that we formed a collective with three other dancers in the early 90s, the Quatuor Albrecht de Knust with Dominique Brun, Christophe Avelet, and Simon Eke. And uh, lab annotation enabled us to recreate, namely, uh, or for example, dances by Doris Humphrey or Nijis Nijinsky's Afternoon of a Phone in the early uh, 2000s. But more recently, it was also thanks to lab annotation uh, score that I was able to propose a critical reinterpretation of Sully by Ruth Saint-Denis uh, for the piece Moving Alternatives in 2019 with a fantastic team of performers among them. Kalik Stonetto, Sherwood Shen, uh, Paul P, Ghislaine Go, Nitsan Margalio, and Shantala Shivalingapa. Uh, I work also with different scores, action programs, in particular those by Anna Halprin, uh, who en enabled me to reinterpret Parades and Changes, her landmark 1965 piece, in dialogue with her. And Parades and Changes would play toured throughout Europe and also in the United States, as it was presented in New York in 2009 at the Dance Theatre Workshop and was awarded a base C, and we were so proud of that. And the team, again, was amazing with uh, Alain Vuffard. Uh, we were talking about him, of course, and he's still very much alive. Uh, in my heart also, but also Didi Dorvillier, um, Nuno Bizarro, uh, Boaz Barkan, uh, who do I, and Vera Montero, of course. So, um, what about emancipation? Uh -huh. So, I start from my personal experience at this relationship with transmission through the written. Uh, has been for me profoundly emancipating. Uh, it allowed a direct access to the history of dance in movement and allowing me to boom, situate myself in my practice and avoid to reproduce the same thing. Emancipation from mimicry and uh, authority figure, since you are afraid of the, perform of the choreographer and the teacher and emancipation from imposed lineages and heritages. Working with girls, you are conscious that there are always uh, versions of the work, translations that you are dealing with and transmitting, and not the original work itself, which in dance is constantly slipping away. Um, so it offered also the possibility to undo, and this is very important for me, the sacralization, sacralization, la sacralisation, comment on dit ça? Oui, yes, of the work and the past, and avoid freezing, uh, freezing the work in a patrimonial dimension. And I love this quote from uh, Walter Benjamin, who says, sorry for the translation, but rather than proposing commemorations that are executions, it is a question of saving the phenomena from the catastrophe that a certain way of transmitting them as heritage represents. They are saved when one brings to light in them the crack. The whole program. So for me, it's very important to always uh, try to question the modes and transmission and their effects. And um, maybe it's uh, just a series of questions. What is transmitted? Which work are uh, available, kind of, so uh, are, have left traces? Which bodies and gesture are in the archives? And who makes history? And uh, we might know it's mainly a white history. And who is transmitting, alone or with other, the choreographers, the dancers, uh, any other persons or IA or whatever, to whom, what, what are the audience concerned, and it might be a very, very large panel, and uh, how, modes of transmission, through direct transmission, scores, constraints, games, um, and for what? What is the intention? So this one is a, a deep 
deep question. And I always wonder how transmission can be an encounter, a dialogue, a co-creation of new links between a work and uh, its recipient. How can we facilitate the elaboration of a situated point of view or a plurality of point of views uh, and be critical in a good way? How can we make people aware of the game of gaps, of uh, disappearance, absences, distances, either as close as possible to the score or in a speculation that might bring out new potentialities in the work? What is constitutive of the work? Is it uh, the creative processes? It's, is it the graphic writing, by example? And what is it that continues to act today and might be a fertile resource for nowadays? And so I will finish with the, the, the case of my current project, Sourcier, which is a, a game in between sorceress and sorceress's daughter for an environmental and feminist uh, history of dance, with, uh, which focuses on North American postmodern choreograph female choreographer Anna Halprin, Trisha Brown, Simon Forti, but also Lisa Nelson. And instead of recreating their dances, I'm, inter I'm more interested in the processes and the sensitive knowledges they have created thanks to their links with specific natural environments. And uh, we are just back of a creative laboratory at, at PS21 in Chatham uh, on how natural environments are partners of creations, how they have changed the way of dancing of these North American uh, choreographers, but also of today's artists. And with a we, we were uh, five with a fantastic moment of exploration in, and sharing with Lisa Nelson, Tara Lorenzen, Mina Nishimura, and French choreographer uh, Laurent Pichot, who is uh, with us today. And uh, this project will lead to a site-specific creation with uh, Wanjiru Kamuyu as a dancer, um, Rosa Ventadou, and Zoe de Souza. And I just wanted to thank um, Elena Sianco for this residency and Villa Albertine and specifically, of course, Nicole Birman. Thank you. What a beautiful lineup. No, I love hearing, I love hearing them. So um, I'm David. Uh, my modes of transmission are as performer, creator, advocate, and instigator. Um, my role is to cause trouble and to create structure. Um, my work, my particular practice, centers around the interrogation of presence and absence and identity as a performative state. Um, my work has... Uh, appeared in, uh, whether it's considered dance or installation or engagement, um, from a range of intimate conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations regarding the sources of identity that almost become a confessional booth to uh, another piece, uh, The Voyeurs, where the public is eavesdropping via their own phones into an intimate conversation. Um, that's being had in the park between two individuals uh, discussing race, violence, and um, there's a third part, race, violence, and questions of um, intimacy. Um, I feel that the structures, each of these containers really are forms, the containers are forms of transmissions that are really important to think about how we transmit something, whether it's live or digital or in the distance or up close, is really important when you're thinking about what a work is or what the engagement is and what, what's really important about sharing. Um, I feel like I am a structuralist in certain ways, uh, looking at how things connect. Um, uh, but that also, the, the concept of transmission leads me back to a conversation yesterday about the body being an archive and how essential that is. And how, you know, over the course of the last 40 or some odd years, 
watching how bodies change and watching how work changes because of bodies, and how that's really essential for us to recognize. Um, I remember the first time I saw the Trisha Brown Company and I saw Iran dancing, and it just blew me away. But also understanding that Iran is such a unique and brilliant mover that is not rec bookable. You can't, you can't teach that. You, can't, you can share ideas about it, but the essence of and the scent of the way she moves and how she negotiates is something very unique. And that's something that's locked in history and it's locked in her body. And when you think about a work and the creation of the work, the identities within that creation are locked in that moment. They can never be done again. And so when you reconstruct a piece, what are you reconstructing? What are you sharing? And how do we sometimes think about preserving the flower but losing the scent? And how do we also look at... <laughs> So, <laughs> okay. so, yes, and so it's this is interesting thing when you think about what, what are we, what do we think about when we archive in this new age? And what, what information do we have that we're actually passing along? And how does that then get translated through the new contextual shape of the politic, politic or the physical? and knowing that the bodies are recreating work, but they're not recreating the work. Um, one of the lines that um, I always remember from Diane Madden was that every time you go on stage, you're recreating this work. And that's really important to know. It doesn't exist unless you do it. You have documentation, but that's only a form of remembrance, yes? Um, and that's also mitigated by the screen or by the materials. Um, I spent 10 years working with Corey Olinghouse, building uh, an archive database for Trisha Brown's work. Because I had worked with the company, I had really intimate knowledge about how she worked and how the work was connected. And it was really important for me to structure this database in a way that would really reveal and um, sort of uh, parallel the underpinnings of the construction, the, re the conceptual work, the structural relationship of the material, the, the range of collaborators and how they integrated within that history of the work. Um, and it actually goes down to almost a very granular um, moment of looking at the building materials and knowing from this moment to this moment, this person is doing this named material that you can source, uh, as well as understanding the relationships of the building material to the sections within a piece and how this particular material may appear in other works. So that's a transmission of structure. It's a transmission of uh, the conceptual nature that one might not readily see when you see the work, um, especially if you're not seeing the range of the work over the course of time. Um, but it's also a limited idea. Uh, one of the aspects that I feel is really important right now that we're having discussions on is what is the legacy of a choreographer? Is it really the work or is it the three-dimensional aspects of who they were, who they are, how they thought on so many different levels, what were their writings, what were the accidents that happened? For example, when you mentioned um, when she was making Sky Map and she called in for these scores, excuse me, what, what are those stories that actually um, reveal who that choreographer or that creator was? Secondary to that are the, I think of, when I think of dance history, I think of, it's not just the making of the work, it's the, the setting and the landscape in which the work was made. What, was, what were the economic or political environments that these works were being made from, and why did they become this way? What was the impact of that? 
that's part of the transmission of the creative act, working within strictures, but also working within um, other fields of influence. And I feel like this, the idea of archiving and transmission is almost quantum in how the multiplicities of actions and nodes are connected to this one particular piece or work or body of work. Um, I, you know, so in looking at legacy, I think going forward in this world, how do we, sometimes I think about the idea of fracturing the archive. How do you open it up in a way, it's like there's a mode of preservation, but there's a mode of dialogue. And I think you're, you're activating that in different ways as well, and as, as well as you. And this idea of how do we bring people in to have dialogues, not just in relationship to the work itself, but in relationship to the conceptual, historical nature of the individual or the institution, so that these smaller stories also get daylight. Maybe these relationships are, are looked upon or seen in ways that would otherwise be lost in history. And I think the transmission becomes much more three-dimensional when we look beyond just the work because it's the people behind the work, it's the actions, it's the accidents, it's the places that actually shape and form. It's like when you're cooking. Are you cooking on gas? Are you cooking on electric? Is it a, is it a campfire? Is it outdoors? What kind of herbs do you use? You know, all of those things. It's like, you know, you pick one herb or another and it changes the work, you know? So, uh, it's, I feel like the transmission I think of as a scent in a way. It's something that you remember, but it's also very tactile. And it has to remain tactile. And that's the question, how do you keep it alive? And how do you reinvigorate it? How do you keep adding to the stew as it slowly cooks? That will feed a village. And so you're constantly cooking this pot, and it's always cooking, and people are always eating from it. And you use the same base, but it grows. I'm blown away. I don't know about you. <laughs> so this is incredible, because the conversation, like, how it just went down the line and I felt there's like a transmission line like going on here with with several things and even maybe I wasn't here yesterday but I could imagine also like how the conversation today could link to the questions of pedagogy right and and how is it that then within the space of pedagogy you can think about how is it that you actually teach the scent <laughs> how is it you know like the process of this cooking and this and this transgression emancipation but also like this, this, the sociality that dance always already is, right? So I have a, like a few questions that maybe, maybe I just throw them in and then as, a, as an excuse for all of you to start thinking about your own questions. Um, but I was thinking a few things. Um, the question of form is also a question that is important, I guess, in, in the act of transmission. And in thinking about how is it that one transmits, I cannot help but to think between the difference between the document and precisely the scent or precisely the desire to, to emancipate or, or to transgress even the authority or authoritarian authority of the author, right? <laughs> right? And to actually start thinking through the kind of um, irreverent quality of the work, right? The work sometimes wants things that even the author may be afraid of, <laughs> you know? So in thinking about, you know, for instance, a collection, right? How is it that one collects as one must collect? And every dance scholar is hyper grateful to the existence of the, you know, the dance collection of New York Public Library. We'll revere, we need it, we, we need to be there, we need to be in the archive. And at the same time, I'm thinking about how is it that the spirit of something can linger in the document. So this will be like one question. 
And even like thinking about the difference between in, in law, like the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. And sometimes you need to go to one and the other, uh, right? So I'm just wondering like if you want to explore a little bit further, you know, when you're transmitting, do you, you know, how much do you transgress to a certain point that actually the form is no longer there and therefore the work is no longer there? You see what I'm saying? Like, I don't know if you want to go down the line again or if you have like other, other forms of jumping in. I'm, I am just thinking of the, um, uh, this idea of transmission with um, how do you prepare the context and the terrain, the ter terrain of transmission so that it's not that you are bringing a, an object, a form, uh, to people that are totally empty, but how do you uh, make them aware or uh, invite them to be aware of what they are peopled with, like these shapes, this gesture, this... Uh, and so that it's a conversation. So I don't really answer to your question, but <laughs> it, uh, it, it brought that uh, in, it put me that in mind. And uh, how the fact that the document or the score or actually don't have the flavor or the scent of the dance is actually super interesting because it um, and it is already a transgression. I mean, to to recreate a, a piece from or a dance from uh, something that is totally you could say dead. I mean, a text is really like horizontal, lying. Uh, so symbols, etc., and how it's a really an act of creation to uh, reinterpret and to go from the form, because there are shapes that are written on the, on the page, to the living body and to your inner sensations and to continue to make back and forth into your own creation and what is the, the, the path of the score is really something that is very powerful and probably allow some freedom when maybe when you are trying to imitate or to, to catch the, 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 the style of the, of the person. It's something, and it, I love it and it's super interesting. I don't say this is not a good way of transmitting, but this disappearance of uh, the movement itself uh, allow a whole field of uh, reinvention regarding certain rules. Yeah, I think the, you know, it's, it's a question of, there's so many questions within that, of, you know, like, I think there are four, right? There are four, yes. At least four. At least four. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, I, you know, this idea of appropriation, this idea of ownership, this idea of um, uh, really reinvigorating something or killing something. And I think there's also a beauty in decay about how decay actually feeds something else. Um, and, I, you know, so is there, are there rights and wrongs or are there legal issues? You know, uh, because again, somebody takes your work and they do, do something with it without your permission. How do you, what do you do? Um, you know, the act of transmission is, uh, you were making me think about uh, these scores from Jackson McLow. Um, he was a poet from the 60s and um, he had actually created a series of 40 poems called 40, 40 Dances, 40 Pronoun Dances. And he did it through a series of um, chance operations with language in it. They're quite beautiful and they work as poetry, but they're also dance scores, instructions. Um, and he originally created them for Simone Porti and then actually Trisha took some of the cards and she started working with them. And when I think about the transmission, where's the transmission within the score? It's in the body. It's really in the spirit of the translation. That's, I mean, when you look at translators, you know, there's an original work, but when the score is actually made for the individual to find themselves within it, and in finding yourself within it, it's going to be different from the 60s to maybe the, you know, 2000s because of what those words mean now. But hopefully the humanity stays as a continuity, but you, he's released that 
freedom into the score. Um, yeah, when it comes to recreating work, ah, uh, it's yeah. I don't. I don't really know if I have an answer to that because it's so personal about how people recreate. When I was with the company, when I was with Trisha, we recreated set and reset like three times. We recreated it. And so we'd go back and like, no, it's this way, it's that way. And it's very particular. And so you're asking, what was being lost? I don't know, what did she see or not see? Yeah, what do you gain from that? Um, and also watching the evolution of performance um, when you have, and I think I've seen this with a number of choreographers, the original company that they start out with are the people around their age, there's an individuality. And then as time goes on, it becomes codified to hold the form. And yet they're, they're trying to preserve the work as much as they're trying to hold on to something because they don't know how to allow freedom within that space and still retain what are the parameters of existence. I think part of that is because when work is originally created, the choreographer is making it, it's bespoke on your body, right? right. Like a choreographer is thinking, I have Anne and I have David and I have John and like they're, this is their, this, they have these strengths, these are their weaknesses and you you work to their specific body and how their, mo their body moves. And then in subsequent generations, you're placing what is a highly individual experience on a different body. And that's that's why it gets codified because it doesn't necessarily sit, and you're you're trying to adapt and conform to hold to hold it as you said across history, um, but it's hard. Uh, it, it, we often gather multiple generations of dancers of specific works together um, to talk about particularly iconic roles in dance history. And to a person, they never agree on how the role was performed. Yeah. And they are all like, no, but I was in the room with the choreographer. Like, I know. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you were all in the room with the choreographer <laughs> at different moments in time. And the choreographer's like, yeah, you could, you, you're not, that's not working for you. So let me find something else for you. And they, they make little adjustments and tweaks. Um, and as long as the choreographer is living, that's, that we're all fine with that. And then the burden of history hits us when the choreographer dies, and then we have to think through how to navigate that. I do just also want to say, I, I hear you completely, um, but for me, interaction with archives is actually an incredibly intimate experience. Oh, no, um, and there, there is a capacity to be in dialogue with people who are gone in a way that's actually quite magical. Um, and I think to your question, Andre, the, the role of a curator in collecting is to try and ensure that a collection, it captures the totality of who the person was, not, not just who they were as an artist, but also the motivations for how they chose to live their life and how that is all part of a whole. Um, the person I'm thinking of right now is, um, the, we lost lovely Gus Solomons Jr. Um, who placed his archive with the dance division before his death. Um, some of you may know Gus used to have puppets of Martha and Martha Graham and Morse Cunningham and also a little Gus puppet. <laughs> uh, Martha and Morse weren't always kind to little Gus. Um, <laughs> um, and, and Gus uh, Gus wanted to make sure that those puppets came into the dance division, but not until after he died. Uh, so I, they're coming in now. But but I, to me, those puppets are something where um, you know they, they all the the people who were in charge of just sort of clearing out his apartment didn't know what they were and were almost going to throw them away. And then I jumped on them. Um, but they say so much about him. Like they're this object that reveals something about him and his place in the world that is. It's separate from his work, but also totally part of his work as well. No, I totally agree with you. I mean, I love archives, and actually, my first job. Everybody has to love archives. I did. Well, <laughs> we, I, do. You know, we, we, do, we do. We do. We do. I have to say, my first job was with the New York Public Library when I was 14, <laughs> and I worked in a research library in the Bronx. So I, it, it, I'm there. That's okay. I don't. But you know the. And when I think when I when I speak about archives, it's really about how it becomes a holy thing for certain people, and it becomes a static uh, moment rather than a, a growing dynamic. And the fact that you are holding the range of 
paraphernalia or artifacts that are related to individuals. That's what's really essential. And those are the sort of the, the, the um, refractions mm -hmm. that I think are really important when we think about transmission. It's like how that light breaks out into so many different rays. And it's, it, that's really important rather than just, I think people think of the work at times. And I agree. Yeah. I agree. It's really beautiful, and it's beautiful to know that the puppets will be there because they are amazing. Yeah. They are amazing. <laughs> um, so, Ruth, uh, we have a respondent. Are you ready? Do you have a microphone? <laughs> okay. So uh, to hear the different speakers in this roundtable to, to think about the questions of transmission in, in many different ways, challenging the idea of like collecting and preserving performance, but really more interested about the idea of how we transmit ideas, knowledge, movement, but also trauma and memory through body practices. I'm going to ask a question that comes from a very particular field because I have been working all my life in museums and our and contemporary art centers. Uh, um, Museums that somehow are interested in collecting performance and in preserving performance, I'd say somehow because it's not, it's never completely committed to that. They said that never totally. <laughs> but um, so for, for me, it has been always interesting, of course, like um, finding methodologies to exhibit archives that are coming from performative work in the way that go beyond the idea of the document, of course, and so in the process, the reference, the encounters. Um, but of course, for me, uh, like performance is always like a sort of response to a political or to a um, uh, social moment, as you were saying. Um, so for me, this is a very radical question, but I think for me, performance is actually the only way to give history a second chance. So my question is like, could be performance in museums a method of healing? Uh, and uh, also, um, Yes, will be performance and new methodology for museums to rethink history, to advocate for alternative narratives through embodiment and storytelling. And I'm going to put an example because I mean, like, like a little study case that for me was very important. I, I worked for four years in a project. I mean, actually, Edgar knows about that. When I was at Red Cat, it was, a, it was not a dance piece. It was a voice piece by Leon Ferrari, The Words of Others. It's a performance of eight hours that is based on a text that was written on the 60s. And uh, we performed this piece about the, um, the Vietnam War, about other things, but mostly was responding to the Vietnam War because it was the first war that was somehow transmitted through the media uh, in a very brutal way. So we performed this piece with different people. It was it's an eight hour piece, always 40 voices in different, in, in many places around the world. And in a certain moment, the Reina Sofia in Madrid thought about the idea of acquiring this work. Um, the piece it belongs to everybody. I mean, Leon never thought about selling this piece because it's a text. We created together with Jose Antonio Sanchez, the dear colleague, like a way of like reading that. Uh, but for the Reina Sofia, the question was, if we acquire this piece, perhaps the idea is like, like the moral question of performing this every year or every two years as, a, as something that the museum should do, no? Like it's not going to be there archived somewhere. So that was one of the questions. And all the time that we do this piece, it will come with a series of workshops with different people that will talk about the context of this, that piece in the present, even if the piece will be always be the same. It's not that like we will look for different quotes from different ideas, it will always be the same text. Um, well, they, did, they didn't acquire the piece at the end again, but it was a lot of, I mean, I was part of this conversation of what it mean to, to collect a, such a work, so I don't know. That's my question for you guys. Like, what do you? Th I mean, in terms of museums, like, if you think like this question of like if if performance could be the only way of healing or like giving a history a second chance. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. Who wants to pick that up? <laughs> I, it's interesting. I think when you say healing, I think very particular moments um, and. Uh, you know, when you acquire a piece, what are you really acquiring? And I think of when you were speaking, I was thinking of Tino Segal, who actually doesn't want documentation, who doesn't, there's an ephemerality to the moment that exists. And so what you're buying or what you're acquiring cannot be written down, cannot be documented. It has to be recreated somehow. 
some mysterious way. Um, I was also thinking about Marina Abramovich, and I was part of the retrospective in that work, and um, we weren't performers, we were re-performers. And there's a clarity of like, no, you're not performing this, you're re-performing an idea, a form, and that's what it is. Uh, granted, I will also say that the form of that recreation was not the same as the original. Um, when it was uh, one of the sections uh, being recreated, there were a series of them that were being recreated at the same time. And so it was almost like uh, four pieces or five pieces within a room. And that's very different from having a solitary piece in a room. The relationship, the focus, the space around something totally changes the message and the engagement. Rather than just the documentation of an action, the transmission is actually the architecture of the space as well. And I think that's important. And when, when something's being acquired, these are really important questions for the creator to consider what's important to them, which when you're creating something, you're just creating. You don't know how often it will be recreated or not, whether it'll tour, whether it'll die after three nights. So when something, somebody wants something, what are you giving up? You're giving up your child. How do you want your child raised? You know. And do you want to, do you feel like? Uh, there are so many yeah. like, uh, so it's, uh, yeah, oh, at least. At least four. <laughs> Uh, so I'm trying to, uh, um, I think, yes, as you said, it, it's really uh, about also what is the intention of the, of the author, even if sometimes you often, or very often, you can also uh, look uh, toward transgression. And I think some works are really specific and can be uh, uh, con conserved and uh, owned. But this question of uh, uh, Owner's property is really a very, um, com not a complicated question, but a very political one. And uh, how, as artists, do we relate to these questions? And regarding dance, uh, as you said, uh, a work uh, or dance is uh, uh, only alive if you dance it. So who is allowed to dance it, what for, etc. So I am always very much concerned about the... Uh, le, the power of institutions to like froze the 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 work and the possibilities uh, and uh, I agree with you that um, performance might be a, a healing process and I am thinking to a, 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 this work with moving alternatives um, about uh, this um, rep uh, repertoire from Ruth Sandoli and Tetchon, and how we gather a lot, uh, a multiplicity of point of views and of uh, stories to uh, deconstruct and question the representation, these uh, major figures of uh, North American history have been creating at their time and who, uh, which bring questions regarding uh, exoticism, cultural appropriation, gender identity, and how you, uh, you if you want to go back, uh, because I, I question myself, should I go there? And I thought, okay, as a, a French white choreographer, it's part of my heritage, and what is my job? Uh, how could I deconstruct the, fast, the, the importance of that? And I think this has to be done all the time. Uh, um, yes, examining what is at work, what was at work at the time, and how does it uh, trouble us, uh, uh, deplace us, and uh, how we can invent uh, tools to uh, to not to totally eradicate, uh, erase, or refuse these works, but to be able to, uh, okay, and I see, uh, and I remember what I wanted to say, that the body is a fantastic tool to, um, to think, to, to uh, yes, I think it's the sensitive tool, and as long as you didn't perform a work, I think you don't, you, you just know it from outside. Uh, so that's... A few things. I'll, I'll speak to the museum part of it. Um, I think there are maybe certain works where 
cultural institutions need to make commitments to performing them on a regular basis, um, where there's a moral imperative to do so. Independent of your question, I've been thinking for a long time about how to um, address indigeneity in our archive. And the fact that the that overwhelmingly indigenous communities, some do, but most don't want to be documented, and that is absolutely their choice and their right, and I support it, but then there's still the issue of absence of representation for them historically, and how to, how to try and address that. Um, and so I've been thinking about ways in which we could maybe do exactly what you proposed, which is welcome them in to perform on at regular intervals as a way to archive in real time. And they have community constructs that would allow for that to happen. I, I think the, where the struggle might be with other works is it, we get back to that thing of like the shifting of work as we move through history. Um, if the museum doesn't have access to uh, the right group of dancers and you know the, the right body of knowledge in perpetuity, how do they maintain that long-term? On the Lincoln Center campus, most people in this room will know, on September 11th, the Table of Silence is performed every year, um, starting uh, when the first plane crashed to mark that occasion. And while we have Jacqueline Buglisi, that will always be. I imagine Lincoln Center will want to keep it going long term. I just don't yet know sort of how, the, how that will structurally be possible for them. So I think those are questions that remain to be answered. I, I cannot help. I, I'm sorry. I'm going to transgress my position. As do, do we need to finish? We have 15 minutes, right? I'm keeping. I'm keeping in time. That that I'm not transgressing. But moderators should not say things. But I feel like I want to say something about your question because your question is amazing. The you know can performance give a second chance to history? And I was thinking about. Can re-performance give a second chance to history? Um, and we're going to give just a very quick anecdote. I, in the summer, I was um, occupied in working in the revival of a piece that I had work in Portugal in 1997. So 26 years later, this piece was being done by a Portuguese choreographer, Francisco Camacho. I'm not going to go into this whole thing, but I'm just going to say that originally there were 14 dancers. Right, and now of the 14, only six was, were from the original cast, and there were younger ones who were not even born when the piece was premiered in 1997. And they're already like mature dancers, 27 year old, right? So, um, so we were like, okay, we need to transmit to the new ones. The new ones got the piece like this, the, the new dancers. It was the older ones who, who had to deal with the image of what they were, <coughs> in the past, and there was one particular dancer, and that was really, really interesting to think about re-performance and giving history a second chance. Because there was one particular dancer that had created all the movement, she was, and she, she was not just landing, she was not landing, she, and she knew, ah, 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 ah. And there's one day, very close to the opening, that you could tell she's finally there. And I went to say, you know, Philippa, you're like, you're there, and she said, can I tell you what happened? Because you're you not going to think I'm crazy. I'm like, no. Okay, so she, she said, throughout the whole rehearsal period, six weeks of reenacting this thing, she said, oh, when I was looking to everyone around me, especially the new dancers, I was seeing them, but I was also seeing the image of those who are not longer here in front of them. So I had like this constant hallucination. And it was only today that I finally saw those who are actually here. And then I could dance. Which for me means to be... So she gave history a second chance by, free, by being fully engaged with the present, with the now. You know? And that's what I feel like all of you are saying. Like Once re-performance is no longer lingering with the image of the past, Right, but to actually fall into a full engagement with the present, then you are doing it. You know, I feel that that's what's going on. So I appreciate your your question. Okay, so now we have ten, 
we keep going. Uh, I'm a very obedient dancer, so I followed the score. So now we have time for the dance, for the audience to ask questions, for the dancers. Yes, so any questions or comments or, yes, please. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. Um, my name is John Hubiar, dancer, uh, producer, etc. cetera. Um, I asked this question as like a firm believer in transmission and someone who has loved learning as a dancer works by other artists from other generations. Uh, but I do have this question of if at a certain point no longer presenting transmitted versions of works does best serve a work when there's so much distance between the hand of the author and other generations of performers. Saying this again as a, a performer myself who has loved learning older versions of work. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just thinking about this, t this tension between uh, the, the possibility and, and potential of transmission and of reperformance um, to activate history in these ways we were just talking about with uh, the distance from the hand of the author that comes over time and how to hold these things in balance. Uh, two, two thoughts that the, um, um, the distance... Um, no, okay. Uh, the fact that as a dancer and as an artist, and uh, I think for me it's uh, super important to uh, was, uh, what I said to be situated. Uh, otherwise, you are you keep repeating things and uh, imagining you are inventing. And uh, for me, it's really a, a dialogue. So, if you can't perform the pieces, if you can't see them perform you will be kind of uh, blind to what is your history and what has happened before. So for me, it's, it's very important and it's almost a political issue. Uh, so let's say that's what I wanted to, to say. And uh, distance, distance, yes. Uh, <laughs> Distance, uh, it ob obliges probably, it obliges you to uh, shift the attention more toward the process of dialoguing with uh, something that has disappeared, that is uh, full of uh, holes, etc., of, uh, of uh, absence. And the process is also uh, as important as, the, as the, op the work itself, maybe. Just one thought about language, um, the physical language of a work or a choreographer, if it's very specific. Um, and again, I'll just speak from Trisha, which is a very, very particular world. And um, that while there's no codified technique, it, there's a learning through just working in the work for an extended period of time. And I think right now, when we think about work and or reconstruction, or even building work, what what time do we have? How much time can we afford? And if we don't have the time to actually research or dive into the waters of that and really feel that language and learn that language, it's going to evolve. It's not going to be the same. And I think that's something about losing language. Um, language will always be shifted, French, shifts, English shifts, do we allow it to shift? That's the question. And at what point does it then become its own dialect? Linda, do you want to say something? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think the, the problem is if you, if you don't put the work on bodies to to the earlier point that was made, then it's just documentation to engage with the work. You have to be present in the room with it. Um, there are certainly problematic elements to older works, and those I'm perfectly fine with retiring to the archive. Um, it's not appropriate to have them on 21st century bodies. Um, I do think it's important we don't erase our history, though. Um, I think we we need to know what all like the whole truth of what we did on stages before because while it may seem like canceling something is 
is in the best interest of moving forward, it's always really important not to forget the racism that was perpetuated across stages um, and the trauma that caused. It's really important to know that and acknowledge that and to learn that history. So I, I think those things do have to be retained in an archive and understood. And I think that's the appropriate place for that kind of information to reside. Um, I can't actually answer your question because it's really, it's, an, it's a knife edge, right? Um, I agree with you. Like the, the further away you get from the choreographer, the further away you get from choreographic intent. But, um, you know, I, in the archive, I have seen more than one choreographer basically say that from the moment that the, the performers go on stage and perform it in front of an audience, it's not their work anymore. You know, that as you said, every, every single time you perform it, it's a recreation. And as long as you acknowledge that and accept that, I think that's okay, you know. Uh, please. Uh, yeah. uh, I guess it would be the last question. My question. Oh, thank you so much. Um, my question is something about the transmission here, which I find um, really interesting because you are going from the written word, you are going from the archives, and none of that bothers me at all because, in actual fact, even if a dancer shows another dancer a piece, that is the retransmission and it will be different. But what does distress me a lot is learning from the videotape very fast. And I have the feeling that young dancers can learn all kinds of movement very fast and copy it. And I feel that's where not only the transmission, but their growth gets compromised. So I wondered if you wanted to address that. That goes that. back to your scent, right? The, the, the difference between mirroring something and really kind of understanding the essence of it. I, I hear a lot. I mean, I talk to lots of different people in the dance field. I do hear that there is a, a drastic need for coaching across the dance field. <laughs> somebody very somebody really agrees with that in the back. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean we are we are underfunded as a field. We like there's no question about that. And dance is more underfunded than music or theater, and I think we all know that. Um, we absolutely need to invest in our young dancers. They are they are literally the archive carrying our history forward as well as creating our future. So I think they should have every resource available to them. So I'm definitely in favor of more co more coaching and providing opportunities to previous interpreters of roles, time and resources to come into studios and impart the knowledge that they have. One last, last, last question. Yeah, I would like to testify um, what... Um, <laughs> Yeah, is that right? Why is it yeah. funny? Yeah. It's a, oh, sorry. So I don't know. Witness, give testimony. I don't know how to, to say. Give an account so, of. Yes. I've, I've been the dancer of um, some projects of the Quatuor Albrecht Knust with Anne and Christophe and Simon and Dominique Brun. So then, nota Laban notators. And I would like to connect to the fact of emancipating dancers and also this journey between the past and the present, which is really a strong thing for us all the time as dancers. I'm not talking about that, being a choreographer, I'm talking being a dancer for others and being the dancers for the history of dance also. So that's what also the Quatuor Knust allowed us to live. And um, so there was the first program that I saw in Conservatoire de Paris, the Dor Doris Humphrey program in 92, I think. And then you start to gather people around the uh, continuous project Alter Daily of Yvonne Rayner, who started to come in France and to feel like mo making dance again because of you four and seeing us trying to do things. 
and then at the same time, Satin's falling lover of, uh, of Steve, that was the same program. So we started to embody our references and our history, so that was so strong. That. And then after you have the idea in, in 1999, 2000, to do the um, afternoon, the prelude à l'après-midi d'info of Nijinsky, which was so 1912, which was really uh, in another, another avant-garde. And for us as dancers, still dancing the phone and the grand nymph, because we were allowed to go on. It has been such a strong gift to, yeah, to the, um, to the cast who did that, to the, also to the school of Angers, because you came also for the mm -hmm. students. So allowing through notators to connect to their history is such a strong thing. And since we're dancers, I just want to do something one second, which was such a strong thing in me, because I had the feeling that the history, <laughs> and all that Nijinsky, I could understand something. So I just want to say, to do something that was so <laughs> enormous. <laughs> I just uh, yeah the fact of being the grand neuf just when she there is the phone in front and the grand neuf is just making this and only this moment of the forehead it's just something that so much was so emotional for me and so erotic also yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking okay being a woman in this for him or for her was just that, you know? And I felt, not for the first time, but I felt really a woman <laughs> doing that. <laughs> and the other thing is that for, let's say, five years, we were doing this when Lofon wanted to, to have the woman. And then Dominique Brun once arrived to make me work. And she says, oh, I saw something new. In the, in the score, I saw something new in the score. So now you're not going to do only like this, but you're going to do the, the head of the phone is going to do this. And then in just one vertebra, you have all the animality that it's not only wanting to have the, the nymph, but wanting to have the nymph. It was just... <laughs> It was just so incredible, all those things. <laughs> We've been spending years, crazy years with uh, with people. Yes, and let, let I, me just quote the, the team of... Uh, I, no, uh, the, all, the whole team of this... Yeah. In, in, no, that just... Was okay. No, no, can I just say, because I see me, like, um, and the time. But I also just wanted to say that when you say, I saw something new in the, in the score, someone said, like, the score is also moving, right? <laughs> so, so everything is emotion. So it's incredible because and then the, the whole, the whole the archive score. and the body the collapses. And the score through changes. This, right? So anyway, so should I? I, I think then I feel very oh, this one. Question. Okay. Sorry, Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. I'm... Um, I wanted to um, try to pull a thread through from the performance pedagogy the first day um, and maybe speak about the pressure on young dancers and their, sorry, I'm really emotional, <laughs> and the pressure on these, quote, bodies to reproduce. Um, I think, you know, I'm in a school where there's 200 of them and um, I'll start there. And also to say that when we talk about this idea, I just keep thinking about this labor of these bodies trying to reproduce this idea of what this dance and this history might be. So I want to say that, and the, that it's enormous, and that it's um, fraught, and it's exhaustive. I also want to say that when Dorothee was talking about this, this place they could move through to find one another through this storytelling. I want to believe, <laughs> I have to believe, that when you're speaking of this 
image of this dance that existed outside of these bodies that were trying to reproduce this piece, but in between. Uh, I keep thinking about how Trenti Minha talked about how rhythm actually exists between the instrument and the body, and that we're trying to meet it. And I want to say that with training, or not training, with pedagogies of performance, the question I have is, how do we attune young artists today to find those places to pass through, to meet up with one another, to suddenly distance is not the same, and time is also different. But I, I want to believe that you know, that, that that's what we're, I just wanted to say that you said also, you know, this thing about the spirit of something that can linger in the document. So, yeah, it's there, you know, the joy, it's there. It's not in the bodies, it's in the world. You know, I just want to say that, that like all this pressure that these bodies have to make the joy or recreate the dance, that finding it seems so much more poetic, hopeful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Danafe. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all um, for, yes, the labor and the time um, you put into this. Um, thank you also, Dorothée Will, for the conversation this morning. I keep thinking of the gathering of the dispersed also, maybe as a transmission, an act of transmission. Um, um, André, David, um, and Linda, thank you very much. And we will regather at 1.15. Thank you.